So, hello everyone. Thank you for coming to our roundtable discussion titled Communicating Hidden Histories to Increase Understanding of Colonialism and Racism in Science, Storytelling Through Metaphors, Analogies, and Media. Our title is a bit of a mouthful, but I just couldn't settle on one thing. And so I'm just really excited to have the panelists here to uh, give their own take. We've got um, a really diverse panel of, of experts from different fields, um, but everyone has something really int intriguing to contribute to science and policy discussion and conversation. Um, and so I'd just like to take this time to thank uh, and, I'll, and acknowledge all of the contributors and contributions to science and our collective knowledge that have been silenced or stamped out uh, due to the devious narrative centered around white supremacy and colonialism that has embraced science as we know it. I also want to thank the symposium committee for uh, finding value in this conversation as it was proposed um, to Sunshine, Dr. Sunshine Menezes, who has been a mentor throughout my time at URI um, and everybody else that um, you know has got me here. So thank you. I'm gonna introduce myself quickly, um, allow my co-facilitators to introduce themselves briefly, and then we'll give a few more minutes for the panelists, Jessica, Grace, and Aradna to give a more full introduction of themselves and uh, the work that they do and, and how what they wanna bring to this conversation. So my name is Elise Mason. I use she, her pronouns, and I reside on the traditional lands of the Nipmunk and Pocumtuck people of the Algonquin family of tribes in um, northern New England, in the New England area, um, in the city that is now known as Springfield, Massachusetts. Springfield sits on the eastern bank of the Connecticut River, um, and that river has supported indigenous life for a time immemorial. Uh, my background is in biology, so I did my undergraduate degree in biology at UMass Dartmouth and recently completed a master's in environmental science and management with a focus on coastal management and urban planning from the University of Rhode Island's College of Environment and Life Sciences. So happy to be here working with the Metcalf Institute. I currently work with both the Coastal Society and the National Center for Atmospheric Research, Education and Outreach, along with Dow Sloan grant project that would enhance career development and mentorship opportunities for BIPOC or Black Indigenous people of color students interested in ocean and coastal sciences. And we're doing this in a virtual setting. That's me, um, if Val and then Kendall want to go, and then we'll go in the order of Jessica and Grace and Aratna, that works. Sure. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Valerie Sloan. I use she, her pronouns. And I live and work on the traditional lands of the Arapaho, Cheyenne, and Ute nations um, that was taken around 1850 upon the discovery of gold in the Boulder area. And people were uh, dislocated from there. And um, let's see, so I uh, work at the National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder. And I'm originally from Canada, and I support people who run summer research internships around the country and in uh, geo, geo, broadly geosciences, and also um, the issues of diversity and inclusion and uh, cultural competency are very important to me, as well as the ethics in science. And I'm very excited about this topic and excited to hear from you all. Um, Kendall? Thank you, Val. Greetings, everyone. There's so many folks in here that I know, that I work with, that I have had many good times with. Um, so welcome to our session. I'm really excited to have a really engaging discussion around decolonization and anti-colonial efforts in STEM. Um, I'm Kendall Moore. I'm a professor of journalism at the University of Rhode Island. Um, I come to you from the lands of the Narragansett, Narragansett and Eastern Niantic. I um, am a documentary filmmaker, and you might know me from my film series, Can We Talk? Actually, you might have actually been in one of my films. Um, <laughs> so Can We Talk um, has been operationalized at many universities, nonprofits, and federal agencies as we work towards more inclusive workspaces in STEM. 
I'm currently in production right now on the third film in the series. Um, it's a question mark, decolonizing science. Can we actually decolonize science? So I'm very uh, interested in this topic. I'm looking forward to learning from our panelists and our participants today. So welcome and thank you so much. Um, thank you. I just wanted to double check to make sure that um, everyone can see the interpreter as well as the speaker. Um, that is a technical thing that hopefully our people yes. can take care of. Thank you so much. I have been able to see both all along myself. Okay, great. All right. Hi, this well. is Danielle. Sorry, I'm just popping in real quick. So um, I put a link to the Zoom in the chat if anybody is having um, difficulty through the platform seeing um, both the interpreter and whoever is spotlighted. So um, if you have any other uh, difficulties, just let me know. Feel free to send me a chat. Thanks, Danielle. Um, so I'll give anyone just a second to um, try that new Zoom link. And then that looks good. That looks a little bit different for us. Okay. Um, which order did I say? Did I say Grace first? <laughs> no, I said Jessica first, didn't I? Yeah, Go ahead, Jessica. One day off. My name is Jessica Hernandez, and I'm calling from the ancestral lands of the Duwamish people, named after Chief Seauf, also known as Seattle. I pay respect to the original stewards of these lands and continue to work in relation with both the indigenous peoples of the lands and the city. My background is in marine science and forestry, and I have always integrated indigenous science. Indigenous science is also known as traditional ecological knowledge or indigenous knowledge. I also have a book that's dear to my heart for coming this 2022 entitled Fresh Banana Leaves, Healing Indigenous Landscapes Through Indigenous Science. And thank you all for having me here today. Thank you. Uh, I guess uh, it's my turn now. Thank you so much, Jessica, um, for that welcome. I'm Grace, I use she, her pronouns. And I'm calling in from the traditional ancestral unceded territories of the Squamish, tsleil and Musqueam nations in what is now known as Vancouver, British Columbia. And uh, two things that I, I find really interesting uh, is that there's a new report out that said indigenous led resistance to fossil fuel projects has reduced the amount of fossil fuel emissions massively in, in what we call North America. I think it was up to a quarter they've uh, indigenous led resistance has blocked. Um, and uh, for folks interested in that in Canada, there's a really cool organization called Indigenous Climate Action um, that is kind of an indigenous led climate justice organization that does really amazing work. Um, I'm actually a lawyer and I'm getting, I'm finishing up my PhD in law and I study how the fossil fuel industry manufactures doubt around climate science. Um, so there's, I'm really excited to be here. There's a ton of overlap uh, with, my, with my work and how policy gets presented and science gets presented to the public. Um, and for example, one thing I'd love to get into more deeply today is we see the fossil fuel industry co-opting the language of racial justice now, um, which is obviously deeply problematic. Um, so yeah, really excited to be here and learn from the other panelists. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for being here. My name is Radna Tripathi. My pronouns are she, they. And uh, I'm Indo-Fijian American. My parents were born in the Fiji Islands when it was colony, and we have ancestry from India. Uh, I'm speaking from the lens of the Tongva Gabrielino peoples who are still present here today and who've been impacted by 
the three waves of colonialism that impacted the indigenous peoples of California. Uh, uh, with my work at UCLA, which is a land grant institution, um, it has a complex history with the uh, Tongva peoples. We have been engaged deeply in, in reparative work, and that includes uh, through partnership with our American Indian Studies Center, um, engaging in a, a number of projects that are community-led projects um, to support uh, research and education relating to relationships with land, water, and stewardship. Um, I'm a geoscientist, a climate scientist, and I also uh, founded Indirect, the Center for Diverse Leadership in Science, um, which really focuses on opportunities to support networks and agency and people given the diverse paths and forms of oppression that they encounter um, and really help build healthy environments and uh, that, that we can all thrive in. Thanks. Thank you all so much for those introductions. Um, so I'm going to dive in with a question and um, Kendall and Val, if you also have questions to ask, feel free to um, do that. I also wanted to, you know, I see there's plenty of conversation going on in the chat already, but, um, you know, feel free to make comments, questions, anything in the comments, um, but please do, you know, abide by the code of conduct of the symposium. Uh, so the title of this session was a mouthful, but I really wanted to focus on storytelling. Uh, we see that storytelling throughout time has been a fundamental way in which humans have communicated information. Um, and with science, it's been forgotten that we are also storytellers. You know, there is a point to the research that we do, and there is a story to tell. Um, and I think stories that is happened for because um, stories are often associated with mythology and, and, you know, less concrete narratives. Uh, can anyone maybe grace because you've written the uh, young adult climate fantasy book session, if <laughs> we could talk to that, you know, what is the power of storytelling and, and bringing emotion into stories that science can benefit from? Yeah, I mean, I love that question. And I would say um, someone who I really hold up on this is Adrienne Marie Brown um, uh, with books like Emergent Strategy and Pleasure Activism. And I think she, she does such a good job of showing that when we use science and story to imagine the future that we want in the present, it's so powerful. Um, and, you know, as a lawyer, I know that when I write my research, which is largely on fossil fuel industry malfeasance, and it's super important, and I have 600 footnotes showing how the fossil fuel industry has done this and that, and I'm trying to show over 50 years everything that they've done, that, you know, because of the way the world works, only a couple hundred people will see that. And also because of the way we make information accessible to folks. And so I've started to just play with everything I do. I never release a research paper now without also kind of having some kind of story with it. And obviously we really need the funding to support people to do that. I'm lucky enough that I can fund artists um, to work with me. Uh, but yeah, so I write, <laughs> I got my law professor at Harvard to let me write these young adult romance novels <laughs> that are kind of show this hopeful intersectional environmentalism um, because we know that um, hope moves people and story moves people and that's been shown over and over again. So I'm working on like a comic right now, a picture book with different people, like a photo photography series. And also like that makes sense, right? I have the time to do this research and that's such a privilege. And so I have to make it accessible to the public. I think it's a, yeah. Sure, does anybody else have a perspective on science and storytelling and emotion? You know, one of the things that uh, as I was listening to, to Grace, I think about 
how with a science that uh, that we do, there's really an opportunity to kind of share our own journey to exploring a particular question, um, our own journey to science and uh, in science as a way of actually claiming our own narratives. And in doing so, you know, as a person who is from uh, a, a from multiple groups that have been marginalized within the dominant culture science, I find it to be something that is healing for me um, to actually share kind of that story. I kind of claim my own narrative and in doing so, then kind of that creation of the story, that storytelling is a form of medicine for myself. And it then can also serve as a story that can inspire others to serve as medicine for them. Um, so I, I, I think the power of storytelling is one that's really um, uh, you know, uh, underrated. We don't really teach you know, scientists about the importance of um, sharing, sharing stories and connections, but I think it can go a long way actually in making the, the um, environments that we do science in healthier because we start to then connect as people and share why we're there, you know, in ways that can help to challenge some of those narratives that are associated with the dominant culture that make that those environments so hostile to begin with. Can I jump in or is Jessica? Yes, I was hoping Jessica was going to jump in too. Yeah, um, well, I can go first. So when I think of science and storytelling, I just think of the ways that indigenous communities have communicated since time immemorial. I know that every indigenous communities has their own form or storytelling. For my communities is through our prayers and songs. And as it was mentioned already, I think that storytelling can be a powerful tool for us to tell our own stories instead of a stories being told for us and also for us to write our own stories instead of our stories being written for us. And as it was mentioned already, for many of us who navigate the intersectionality of race with other intersectionalities, identities are often ignored within the science framework. We have to you know, be able to navigate the system. And oftentimes the scientists were told that you know, we have to remain a cultural, right? Like we have to remove our cultures from the science itself because science tries to be ap apolitical and acultural. But I think that for us who hold those identities, it's hard for us to separate ourselves from the science itself. So I think that storytelling and science is a way to reclaim our stories within this framework that has ignored our voices for so many years and also for us to heal, right? Because science, has led to oppression, to genocide, to all these other violent tactics that our communities of color have faced under the name of science. I think it's also reclaiming and also healing for us to be able to tell our stories. I wanted to jump in and bring up some other issues that I would love to hear the panelists comment on. One of which is the fact that part of the enterprise of colonization was to undermine our subjectivity and emotionality in general. But as you know, Western science was becoming in and of itself an enterprise, our ability to bring emotion into that work and into those spaces was diminished and continues to be. That's why we have an issue with the sense of belonging in STEM today. And so we've seen this constant attack on emotionality, but also on our stories because that's where our power was and is and will continue to be, right? So part of the colonial project was to diminish emotionality, our ability to communicate and our ability to have a long telling of our stories, right? So, one thing that I've learned in my work is that filmmaking is so um, useful in predominantly white spaces and white folks have told me this, they feel less threatened when it's not a person of color speaking directly to them. They can hear our stories better when we're on a screen because they don't feel implicated in the crimes of colonization, let's say. So I wondered if 
any of you are encountering these types of issues and how you navigate around them because a lot of us have to deal with white fragility. We have to deal with the inability to deal with our emotions and then they displace our emotions with their emotions. <laughs> so I'm curious to know what kinds of strategies you embed in your work to address this issue, right? Because we're, we're working to find solutions to this, especially in our projects to decolonize, to anti-colonize, et cetera. I see you want to unmute, just do it. <laughs> uh, so I think it's, I think it's really important. <laughs> I'll just assume Kendall, you're picking on me <laughs> with that. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I think that one of the most damaging things about the environments that we're, we're in um, is that we can't actually be present as ourselves um, doing this work in ways that um, are person, personally meaningful to us. And like, it means that we're not able to actually be present in a way that's healthy for ourselves, right? We're constantly being forced to assimilate and be present in this very narrow reductionist way. And that is an environment that, it, it, it's a harmful environment to, to be in. And so, you know, part of being present in this space with the, the positionality and privilege that I have um, as being a faculty member means that I try to find ways to be present in this space and do things differently. Um, and in doing so, you know, being, being myself, finding ways to, to shine, even when that is something that um, causes you know, very hostile, hostile reactions from others. Um, being present, being emotional, being fully, fully myself, and really, you know, as Jessica described it, really kind of reclaiming this space so that it's not Western colonized STEM, but in fact, this is, you know, this is STEM as I want to honor, you know, my family and um, the partnerships that I hold in this place, really. Um, you know, and in doing that, what I see is that it it inspires the next generation. So um, what I see is that, you know, like I was the first woman of color in the spaces that, that I'm part of. A lot of our students experience still being the first. Um, and, you know, this is like some 60 years after Hidden Figures, right? We heard we, that, that story was such a powerful one. Um, and so what happens when people see that, you know, one is willing to be present, be visible, uh, it sets up to them that there, there are reasons for hope. Um, and it also is an opportunity for, for others to see that basically where what they see as my ceiling is their floor. And so that, to me is what also sustains me and makes me more willing and open about sharing my own story um, because I know that it's going to fuel kind of the fire, the fire in them. Anybody else want to add to Jessica, Grace? Yeah, what I was thinking is that um, for us, like we're often told that we have to advocate for ourselves, right? And that's already emotionally draining. So we're advocating for ourselves. And then once we reach that space, because we have advocated for ourselves to be included in that space, then as you were mentioning, we have to deal with white fragility. And I think that we are, we are given this load of emotions that we have to carry, bear with our own emotions, bear with generations, generations of emotions, right? Because we all carry um, intergenerational trauma, intergenerational healing. And then we have to come to these spaces and deal with white fragility, right? White emotions. And I think that white individuals and allies tend to forget that while they might be uncomfortable, for us, for many of us, telling our own stories are also uncomfortable, right? Because we have to um, 
deal with those emotions that come from years of trauma that our generational generations had to deal with, that our families had to deal with. And I think that it's important to continue mentioning that, yes, it might be uncomfortable to have these stories told for you, but also it's uncomfortable for the storyteller to tell their own stories as well. And I think that in order for us to move forward, white allies have to do their own parts, right? Because like I was mentioning, for us, people of color or other marginalized identities, we have to do a lot of emotional labor, right? To advocate for ourselves. Once we're in those spaces, we have to teach others. We have to deal with their emotions because they don't want to deal with their own um, positionality and power. And I think that it's important to understand that we're doing a lot of emotional labor to be even, to even have a space in those tables or in those spaces. And I think that it's important to mention that. So. Um, I, I thought I might just throw an example in from the legal space. Um, because I think there's an interesting corollary. The Indigenous Law Research Unit at the University of Victoria is supporting the work of, you know, the 500 plus nations across what we call Canada, kind of re revitalizing their Indigenous legal systems, each one different um, and sovereign. And, you know, it it's recognized that colonial uh, colonialism destroyed the tried to stamp out those legal systems like it was genocide in every possible way including cultural genocide and uh, so now there's this group of folks who are really have turned inward and and are really trying to um, foster this revitalization and uh, two amazing well there's many amazing writers but the indigenous law research unit and then Val Napoleon John Burroughs and Lindsay Burroughs are all kind of writing about this and, and law has this similar, like we don't do emotions, we're a social science, we're so technical. And, and of course we all know that like the constitution was written by white men who, you know, didn't think women or black folks were people. And, but law is trying to pretend that it's, you know, this objective truth and um, it, that unit is just showing how different conceptions of law were and are in these different nations and John Bros has written a piece about like what does it mean if we we think about lo love in the law like why don't we ever talk about love or emotion or how law could incorporate those and Lindsay and some other folks write about how in western colonial law like you only see the law when there's harm like when there's some kind of rip in the fabric of society but in her tradition in the Anishinaabek tradition law is actually about building community and um, consensus and, and kind of reaffirming these bonds rather than like you only run up against it when when there's a problem. Um, and so I've, and I know that they also have been kind of looking at biomimicry and these other like turning to nature as they think about revitalization. So I think there's some really interesting law and science crossover there in communications. Thank you. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. And that's why I was excited to have you here because the I tried to study science policy in regards to environmental science. And, and what I found was that the policy is just, as long as we pay for the harm that we're causing, nobody cares, you know, like it's, it's fine. And then the messaging that we're being taught is that we're saving things and that we're you know, we're fixing problems in that, but we're introducing these technologies that don't, they're not informed by, you know, the land and the areas with which they're interacting. Um, and there was uh, um, some on-demand content that was uploaded by L Lower, and it talked about um, the language of invasive species and how, um, we're often taught to, you know, that it's it, it's this negative connotation. There's always a negative metaphor that's associated with it. And I see the same with, with climate change and the climate fight. Um, can we talk a little bit about, you know, being intentional with the language that we use when in regards to fighting climate change, when we know that the climate is not the issue, capitalism is the issue. 
such a great question, Elise. <laughs> For me, it makes me think of a, a teaching that my elders have taught to me, right? That we shouldn't refer to invasive species as invasive, but rather displaced relatives, right? Because they might not be our direct relatives, but they're someone's relatives and they have been displaced as plants or, you know, and they have a spirit. And I think that when we mention climate change, we often forget about the Black and Indigenous peoples globally that are displaced because of climate. We see how this country, and I'm talking about the settler country of the United States now, treats climate refugees. We saw how they treated, you know, people from Haiti. We continue to see how they treat many Indigenous groups that are coming from Central America because they're escaping that climate injustice ongoing with the settler colonialism, right? And I think that even the way that we, you know, Western society has taught us to see, you know, plants that are not native to this region as invasive is the same way that's correlated back to the immigration policy when we talk about illegal immigrants, when in reality, these are indigenous lands, settler borders, you know, work created by colonizers or the settler colonialism government that many countries operate on. And as the United States, we have a debt, right, when it comes to the environment, because we're, you know, we're a country that's emitting a lot of greenhouse gases, we're accelerating the climate change cycle that this, you know, that our planet undergoes. And I think that both of them correlate. And that's what I thought about when you asked the question. Yeah, hearing that, it, 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 hearing what Jessica said in your question, Elise, it really made me reflect on just how language is one of the key devices that's really used so people don't, in fact, grapple with the broader structural issues at play and particularly the um, impacts of white settler colonialism. And it's inherent also in the, the associated practices of science and technology. To go back to Kendall, what you were saying, you know, it makes me think about how it sets up then the work that we do, we're studying something, you know, objectively from a distance as opposed to it being integral to ourselves, being a relative, being relative, you know, relative of ours. And it's also prevalent in the end of the, the frameworks that we use for teaching Western STEM, you know, which are, um, are ones that again, like these people come to it, often motivated by their passions, you know, and instead they're separated from it and told to just be incredibly reductive at the, ex and in a way that is very much at the expense of, you know, why they're doing it, their uh, love and compassion for people, for the environment, for systems of play. And then they're also told to treat their, their results in that way, you know, what they're learning in that way um and so it's it's structurally it there's just there's, there's multiple elements you know that end up then shaping also the the discourse around what we find and who that knowledge then ends up being shared with and, and so forth um, so thank you Luis, for your really thoughtful question and jessica for what you shared i want to ask a question about so part of the title um, is about communicating hidden stories, but as uh, racialized, marginalized people, there are some stories that we will not tell <laughs> and we will not share beyond our communities, same with indigenous communities. So I wanna talk about this fact that some stories will not go beyond our communities. So there are some stories that are for the public and some stories that will remain for us for obvious reasons. So I'm, I'm really interested to hear how you articulate that and how that is operationalized in your work. Um, I know that when I'm shooting, there are just things that will never um, go public. It might happen between me and the folks that I'm working with in, in unique spaces, but there's a, you know, a contract there. I disagree that this will just not go beyond us for obvious reasons. So can we can we speak to that, that some things will remain hidden for certain reasons? And what are those reasons? I 
I think there's um, uh, so some stories are sacred. You know, some stories you have to earn trust. You have to be able to hold those stories. You have to hold relationships with the people who would share those stories. You have to, yeah. So, so personally, there are stories that, you know, I will not share with my colleagues that are, you know, white faculty members at work, but I would share with colleagues who have earned my trust, um, who share an understanding of protocols. Um, and, you know, it goes some, something to what Jessica said, you know, I do not need to re-traumatize myself, actually, by being something that you, my story is being something that you learn from. There's data that's out there for you to try to understand and grow your own awareness. You know, you, um, I may take choices about sharing stories with students, you know, or sharing stories in particular spaces. But that, those are my choices. And this is really because I think, you know, is that story gonna be medicine for me and for them? Like, what really is that, that purpose? I think that the work that we've done with, um, with some of our, our partners, we've been um, honored that they have been open to sharing space with us. We understand that you know, there are very specific protocols and there are very specific stories that we will, you know, yeah, that, that as a person who is not from their culture, that's not something we will ever do and we respect that. And so there's that kind of respect that is just so critical here. And it's like, this is not that story for me to, to take and learn. And it's not that all of the world is something that I'm going to be able to understand. Like that's, just such a, a, a white myth, you know, um, that um, comes from this story about having domain over everything, you know, um, and that's just not, not the case. Um, yeah, I'm so glad you brought up that idea of uh, that we have dominion over everything. And that also comes with religious language that is used to perpetuate, you know, all types of atrocities against people of color in the name of science. And so I think that's um, really the crux of where I want to push back against is making sure that, um, you know, people understand why there's doubt. In, in scientific messaging, especially you know now with the COVID vaccine. I think that this messaging has been terrible, but, <laughs> and, and it's, I think it's set up with this binary, either you get vaccinated or you're a terrible person. And I think binaries can be really, really limiting and, and they're often found in science. Um, I don't know if I have a question related to that, but if anyone wants to speak on that, please do. Um, yeah. yeah. Oh, oh, no, please, Aradna. Go ahead, girl. Oh. Okay. Uh, what you said, it just, it made me really emotional in thinking about just, uh, I thought through like thoughts of several hundred years of what's been done in the name of Western science to people who look like us, you know, from testing of sorts to, yeah, just all sorts of physical and psychological harms, right? All sorts of violence. And I just think that, that you know, that is the foundation for Western STEM, right? That, that is the foundation for Western STEM. There has been so much that has been done without consent, without respect, with violence, with appropriation. And until that is acknowledged, until that is like the, the dominant culture acknowledges that. And, you know, that's just the starting point for engagement, for reparative work, right? That, and then so um, at the end of the day, you know, moving forward with the vaccine to, to you know, um, 
climate adaptation and resilience planning to anything, right? To just developing friendships and partnerships. It comes down to trust and respect and reciprocity, you know, and until we acknowledge that history, that's gonna be very, very hard to do. Um, yeah, that, that's really important. And I was just going to uh, add, Elise, what you were saying that my research is really on how corporations weaponize Western science to make money, massive and massive amounts of money. And they, you know, I've, I'm frustrated that for this COVID misinformation, it hasn't been traced back in some part to these like really wealthy white men and, and funders who, you know, part of their game plan is to make certain issues political so that they can weaponize those um, those issues and and keep their money essentially like the the politics of what they want is to keep deregulation and these other things and so there's this research that shows that you know climate change was very specifically undermined and politicized like we have George uh, W. Bush in 1988 running on a message that says, I'm going to battle the greenhouse effect with the White House effect. And then in that 12 years after that, the fossil fuel industry just cranked up its misinformation machine and made climate change a Republican ideal. And they did that because, again, they wanted to keep deregulation. They wanted to keep producing fossil fuels instead of transitioning away. Um, and they're often doing this, you know, and of course, like the people most affected by the fossil fuel industry or these other folks are people already marginalized by other systems of oppression. And it's so horrifying to read through these original documents and see that 50 years ago, 50 years ago, a small group of white men in the fossil fuel industry knew exactly what was going to come. It, it reads like a prediction verbatim of the amount of temper change, the, the economic and political and social consequences of that. And they decided to risk the entire planet and all of its beings for a little bit of extra profit. For me, I was able to tie what Kendo asked with what you mentioned, Elise. And I think that oftentimes, sometimes we don't want to tell our own stories because it's going to become a binary narrative, right? So in that case, like, for me, like it's important to always mention that my story as an indigenous woman doesn't apply to all indigenous peoples. It might apply to some, but not necessarily to all of them. And I think that oftentimes as people from marginalized identities, we have to ask ourselves, can we tell this story? Is this story going to end up causing harm to our communities, right? Because who, depending on who gets to read it or who, who gets to hear it, they might apply that binary situation, right? They might think that, oh, because I heard it from this indigenous person, that means that all indigenous peoples are the same way. And I think that that causes stereotypes, microaggressions, which end up being harmful. And I think that oftentimes we have to, you know, walk on eggshells, right? We have to ask ourselves, should we tell our stories? If we do tell our stories, what kind of harm will it cause? It might cause some benefits, it might cause, you know, something, something positive, but it can also cause something negative. And I think that that's something that we continue to navigate as people. Yeah, I think uh, the continuing to navigate is, uh, you know, that's the most difficult part because, you know, we know that the only way through is forward, um, but we've got to keep ourselves strong enough to, you know, continue to have the conversations and support each other. So thanks for that, Jessica. Um, I've got a question in the chat that I'll read from Catherine on sharing slash not sharing your stories. There is such hunger and demand for these stories. How do you respond when people ask for them? Or how are you working with others to share them broadly, but in your own ways? And I'll let whoever wants to speak, we'll do a grab bag. <laughs> yeah, so for, for um, me, I try to be um, mindful of where, where I'm at. Um, really, that's really important and making sure that it's something that will be um, healthy for me. Um, I think that also there, are, I'm often also very conscious of when 
somebody asks me to share a story, exactly how are they approaching the framing of it? What exactly are those dynamics? Is it exploitative? You know, how do, what are the, what is the lens that they, that they write from? What is the, the purpose of this? Um, yeah, so I just try to be very, very mindful. And then in terms of thinking about um, when we are working with others, um, you know, if, if we want to engage with them to see if they might be, you know, consider sharing their journey or their wisdom with others through stories, we try to be really careful about how we're, how we're approaching it. We really are careful about thinking about power dynamics, you know, actually approaching with a spirit of reciprocity. Um, that's really critically important and also meeting people where they are. It's actually um, not, it, you know, again, we want the sharing of the story to be medicine for them. And then if they're open to sharing it, then for others. So also giving them the ability to take a decision after that story has been shared, if we're thinking about how that will be disseminated to take a choice um, about whether they want that to be shared. So there's kind of those different aspects of it. Um, hey, can I jump in with another question? Love to hear the panelists share their thoughts on recently in one of my classes, one of my students admitted that he didn't believe in climate change. And I said, well, can you present me with your data? Empirical evidence, give me your argument. He said, no, I don't have any evidence. I haven't talked to any scientists. I just believe that climate change isn't real. And I said, That's not, I need to see some evidence. He's like, I don't, I don't believe in evidence either. I just believe in what I believe. But then it got me thinking that we have two different things that don't necessarily have to have a relationship facts and truth, <laughs> right? So in STEM, we deal with facts, which, you know, without context or a relationship to truth really don't do much work, right? So I'm really interested to hear you give me your ways of dealing with sometimes the disconnect between truth and fact. And I know, Aradna, your work around climate change, you're confronted with this all the time. Yes, the philosopher. So how do you reconcile this issue? Does this come up in your work? Because I feel that in our cultural spaces, we very much so deal with multitudes in the space of truth and facts, but very much so my truth, the truth, our truths, right? And yet in this predominantly white scientific Western space with its vestiges from colonization, has us focusing so hard on facts and not thinking about the connection or disconnection between the two. So can we, in the last nine minutes of this session, because that's how I always have to bring up the, the, the heavy question in the last few seconds, um, some thoughts on that. And has it shown up in, in your work? I know, it's, I know it has to have shown up in your conversations around climate change, just like it shows up in mine. Yeah, so I think that it's it's really important for people to, um, for yeah, for, for people who are uh, Western scientists to actually have an understanding about the history and philosophy of Western science, right, and to understand how knowledge is constructed, different ways of knowing, the different ways of knowing that exist, and the different things that we can uh, sense and say. Um, with Western STEM tools and with other STEM tools. I think that, you know, there are paths forward, but it comes from really acknowledging that there are multiple ways of knowing. And so grounding ourselves in that, you know, how we teach about this is what, what I find to be, to be incredibly helpful as a, as a way for you know, moving forward when I encounter this in the, in the classroom. Um, yeah, Jessica, I don't know. Grace, what you want to share on that? I think I kind of um, agree because oftentimes, like I'm also teaching introduction to climate science. I haven't gotten a student saying that, but I think that for me, like I try to show them 
evidence versus proof. And I think Grace might have more of the legal framework of what the differences are, but we have evidence for climate change. We might not necessarily have the proof, right? Because that's not a fact, because like our earth is like oftentimes like, you know, switching, there's different things that, you know, will determine the predictions for the climate um, futures, right? And I think that for me, teaching introduction to climate science like I, we have to follow a western textbook right that doesn't have any stories that doesn't have any narratives that doesn't say how climate change is impacting people is oftentimes focusing on like you know the satellite measurements the surface temperature and i think that as as an indigenous person like I'm interested in bringing in the indigenous science. So I get to share stories, not necessarily my own, but like share stories from other indigenous communities, from, you know, the islands, from Africa, from different continents, the global South that we tend to ignore a lot. And I think that that allows students to see that I'm not just lecturing because I'm this like climate change, you know, like hardcore scientist or believer that, you know, they're actually seeing other perspectives. And sometimes that might change students' perspective. Sometimes it's not, right? Because oftentimes the way that we think or our thoughts are generational, right? We're, we learn things from our parents, our grandparents, and oftentimes it's hard to break those cycles. But I think that, you know, focusing on the students that do believe in climate change who are willing to learn is oftentimes sometimes what I have to remind myself, right? Because sometimes we try to make somebody change their perspective, but they're never going to change. And hearing what Jessica said reminded me of like, it's like, you know, in practice that can often look like um, thinking about the fact that everybody is actually born a scientist, right? They may not see themselves as a scientist, but everybody is born with a curiosity of the world, making observations, sensing in the different ways that they, and, and that runs deep in our families, right? That runs deep in our communities. And so at the end of the day, sometimes, you know, in thinking about the specific student who, um, you know, contacted you, Kendall, with that query, it can, one can sometimes, or with that statement, one can also, sometimes talk about then the experiences of, um, you know, that farmers are having or observations that people have who have been working in botanical gardens or experiences of indigenous peoples where there's multiple generations of knowledge that's been handed down orally and written, you know? And so it, there, there are different ways of connecting with people, but the stories themselves, you know, and really thinking about that framing is, is so important. I also think that sometimes people have a mistrust of um, the professor, right? You know, depending on, it can even come from college students, right? Depending specifically and culturally where they're coming from or of the scientist, you know, that is wearing that, that hat, labeled scientist. And so there is, I think, a really important point, a set of points that are made actually in the chat about how sometimes when you have familiar voices, um, you know, when you have, when there are people that you hold trust with, that you share aspects of identity with, um, they're the ones that are sharing their stories, uh, then, you know, people are going to be much more than disposed to connect to that than they might from, from you know, somebody else. Um, yeah, I, I love all of this. This is, I wish I could have these conversations every day. Um, I'm, I'm picking up what all of you have said. And there's this really interesting social science that shows scientists initially thought that the reason the public didn't believe in climate change is because there was a gap in scientific understanding. And so for a decade, yeah, I can see you guys all nodding. They, they worked on that. And then there's been this really interesting thought, which I'm sure you guys all know about, but that actually motivated reasoning plays a massive amount. Like you really want to be belong to your community and it actually trumps a lot of how you feel about other things. And so if your community doesn't believe in climate change or is worried about its economic consequences, it's not a conscious thing, but you will unconsciously. And so what they see actually is that folks who are part of a community that doesn't believe in climate change, but actually have the highest scientific literacy are the best at making arguments against climate change because they use their scientific literacy to advance their the identity. And so, you know, that that generational understanding that you were talking about, Jessica, like, and what's also really interesting is that as a fossil fuel industry, it's it now knows that it will be sued for fraud. 
if it continues to undermine climate science straight up. And so it's now using this like 15 other tactics. That's what my newest chapter is just on of polluting and undermining public participation, co-opting racial justice, blaming individuals, um, focusing on recycling, which is a fossil fuel industry scam in many ways and gives them $400 billion in profits. But one that I find like so morally egregious is doomism, that there's no hope that we've crossed the precipice. And of course we then see I'd say predominantly white groups taking up that message and repeating it like an extinction rebellion or some others and and kind of having this really you know white supremacist urgency framing of like this is the first existential threat like we have faced um but that doomism is so effective at immediately neutralizing the people who care the most because it's so powerful to see this vision of flame in your future and feel like there's nothing you can do about it. And so a poll recently said that actually 25% of Americans believe in climate change but think we're helpless to act on it versus only around 11% who don't believe that it's either happening or human caused. And so just how protean and sophisticated and well-funded the fossil fuel industry is, as they like create this massive propaganda campaign that we're all kind of working within. Yeah, and I'm glad there's one more question in the chat that I did want to touch upon. We only have a few minutes, so. Um, and then if we can end with a message of hope, something that you know you find inspiring, something you're looking forward to, um, that would be awesome. So the question is, how do we build coalition to amplify the voices of those who have been oppressed by science um, and to change what science is? And that's from Teresa. So I think that these types of conversations are so important. They're tough spaces for connection. Um, and ultimately, you know, yeah, engaging in, in connection, really starting to think, growing our ability to think relationally, um, particularly about our relationship to, to place and people locally uh, is, is so, so important. So when thinking about building coalitions, like, act local, <laughs> you know, <laughs> what, you know, what are you doing to be in service to those who, to the ecologies of the marginalized communities in the place where you are, right? Take a really hard look at that. And what, you know, what, what are you doing to amplify voices of those calling for change? Um, what are you doing to support them as change makers? Um, to me, that's that's really critically important. For me, I think my message is be willing to unlearn and relearn, because oftentimes what we have learned is the dominant narrative, right? And obviously, we all know that the dominant narrative tends to ignore the marginalized voices or voices of communities of color. So be willing to unlearn, relearn, and listen, right? It shouldn't go in one ear and come out the other ear. You should be able to take that, what you just heard, and be willing to unlearn and relearn whatever dominant narrative we have been taught. Yeah, uh, that echoing everything that you said. Um, I don't know if you guys saw Jessica put uh, the link to her book in the chat. That's something that I'm going to do that I feel really hopeful about. I think it's so special when people in this fight and you're talking about the emotional labor. And I can only imagine that doing a book on top of that really added. So I love to get books as gifts for everyone. Uh, and yeah, amplify the voices of, of people like here on this panel doing the amazing work. Okay, that is three o'clock. I don't know if we're gonna get cut off, but thank you all so, so much for being here. I'm super inspired and um, looking forward to, you know, continuing these conversations in the future.